All right, my name is April Wolf. I'm the Therapeutic Recreation Specialist for City of Reno. Um, this is our monthly hybrid SCI Lunch and Learn uh, that's brought to you by City of Reno, Renowned Health, the VAC and Nevada Healthcare System, and the High Fives Foundation. Um, and we try to bring topic-based uh, speakers. Um, so this month, we're excited to invite Nikki from the High Fives Foundation. A lot of you may know him if you work out at the Sierra Johnson Healing Center. And with that, I will turn it over to Nikki. Thank you so much. Can you guys see me right now? Yeah, we can. Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much. I'm actually here at the C.R. Johnson Healing Center. Um, so yeah, so for those of you guys who don't know me, I am the head of strength conditioning, personal training, um, health and performance at the C.R. Johnson Healing Center. The C.R. Johnson Healing Center is located in Truckee, and um, we serve and cater towards any athlete that has been funded, or even some athletes as well, that are funded um, outside of high fives athletes as well. So um, anybody who suffered a spinal cord injury, high fives, gives scholarships, grants, funding, um, brings those athletes into the facility. We have massage therapy, physical therapy, um, practitioner, uh, acupuncturist, uh, mental health therapist, and of course, this beautiful training facility that's right behind me as well, where Jeff Andrews works out. Um, and then also Luke Eckenberg here, who's going to be helping us demonstrate some of the movements that I'll be teaching you guys and educating you on how to do when it comes to looking at how we can keep and maintain joint health across the lifespan. So that's why I wanted to title this um, presentation, Joint Health Across the Lifespan, because that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at joints. I'm gonna teach you kind of like what a joint is, how they function, how we use our joints, and ultimately what happens when we don't use our joints properly, whether it be because we suffered an acute injury, um, we can't because we have a spinal cord injury, or if it's a lifestyle factor, right? If we're in um, chronic positions consistently, how that can affect our joint health as well. And then ultimately, I'm going to give you guys some tools. Luke's going to demonstrate some stuff as I coach him through it on how to implement joint health into your daily routine. So that's exactly what we'll be going over today. So So this is the C.R. Johnson Healing Center. I kind of already talked about it here. Um, just kind of layout of the facility. But let's just get right into the good stuff. Okay, the stuff that excites me because I'm a nerd um, and I love exercise science side of things. So what is a joint? Okay, ulti ultimately a joint is just a body part where two bones meet. So we have multiple joints throughout the body, you know, whether it be the ankle, the knees, the elbows, the shoulders, the neck, um, the shoulder blades, which... Some people don't technically refer to as a joint. Um, we have joints in our hands. We have joints in our feet. Uh, we have joints in our spine. Our body, our axial skeleton is comprised of joints. And generally speaking, something we look at here, especially within the spinal cord injured community, where a lot of our athletes are in chairs, right? Um, we look at shoulder joints, okay? And the shoulder is a very interesting joint because the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body. It has the most degrees of motion throughout any single joint in the body. And inherently what that means is, since it's so mobile, it is also the least stable, okay? And that's why the shoulder is so susceptible to injuries. We talk about spinal cord injuries, people in wheelchairs in general, everyday athletes, right? shoulder injuries are extremely common. So when we're in the facility at the CRJ or with my own clients, high fives athletes, we're always looking at keeping the shoulders healthy because the shoulder is already an extremely vulnerable joint. So not to get too deep in the weeds on joints, um, but again, like all these joints have different types of functions, right? So the, the gross function of a joint is to allow for movement, right? So if our body was an axial skeleton, Okay, just like the skeleton we see here, and it didn't have any joints, we had muscle all on top of it, we wouldn't be able to create movement because the joints serve as either a pivot joint, we can see here in the, the neck, um, a hinge joint at the elbow, we have ball and socket joints, whether it be the hip and the shoulder, condyloid joints, which are a little bit more fancy, um, ankle joints, and then we have saddle joints. We have all these different types of joints that allow um, movement to occur. 
And I like to look at and assess the joints before we look at muscle tightness or um, some other overlying issue, right? Because to me, looking at the axial, axial skeleton, we know that the joint itself is the deepest part of the body, meaning it's literally connected to the axial skeleton. And on top of that, we have fibers, we have muscle mass, we have tendons, we have ligaments. So my approach is always looking at things from the inside out. Let's look at the joint first. Let's see how the joint is functioning, how it's moving. And then from there, let's see how we can improve the range of motion, the stability with strength exercises to help the shoulder, or excuse me, to help the joint health in the long term. So these are just some, some of the joints. We have plenty more. So I just want you to get an understanding. This is, don't get overwhelmed by this. Just kind of follow along with me. I know there's a lot on here. A lot of this doesn't really relevant. I want you to get an understanding how we create movements from joints voluntarily. Okay, this isn't involuntary, but voluntarily. So you have your brain, your brain communicates with your, or you tell your brain to do something. It gets sent down your spinal cord to your peripheral nervous system here. And then it creates movement at the peripheral nervous system, the body. Okay, so it's just important to understand that the joint is executing the movement that's being created in a higher place. Okay, so we're conscious, consciously at least, right? So we're consciously creating these decisions when we're exercising, um, going through these movement patterns to create these motions. And if we don't, okay, we have a negative cascade of things that begin to happen at the joint, which then affects the rest of the body. Okay, so I just want you to understand that the, the thought of the movement starts at the brain, again, voluntarily, and then it gets sent down your nervous system to the peripheral nervous system, which is the innervation of nerves into muscles and stuff like that. So when we look at the, we know how we create movement at the joint, okay? When we look at what happens when we stop moving the joint, okay? Like I talked about, you're sending a signal to your body. So we begin to, if we deprive ourselves of these movements on a consistent basis, if we don't consistently use our joints and bring them through their full range of motion in the way in which they're intended to, a cascade of events start to happen. So <clears throat> loss, of motor, loss of motor pattern, right? So as you fail to continue to give yourself a stimulus telling yourself, hey, I need to bring my shoulder up, I need to rotate it around, whatever it is, you lose the ability to do that from a motor patterning perspective. So you lose the signal gets more and more and more chattery and dark. And eventually it might get to a point where your body forgets the signal completely. So if we don't continue to use our signals in the ability our shoulder and our joints want to function, that signal will decrease in quality. It'll get more and more staticky, okay? Obviously, if we're not moving our joints, we're not gonna be using our muscle mass, right? This is why when we suffer, suffer spinal cord injuries and we can't use parts of our body, muscle mass atrophies, okay? The joint, excuse me, the muscle surrounding the joint is obviously no different. If you don't consistently use that joint through its full spectrum of motion, you'll lose the muscles in the fibers. I shouldn't say lose, right? But they'll sh the muscles in the fibers will shrink. They'll get smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? So that's another negative side effect of not using the joint in the way it's intended. And then also you have an increase in muscle tension, which again is caused by the nervous system. So this is, you know, saying, hey, my, my pecs are tight, right? Or my hamstrings are tight, okay? So tension increases and you start to begin to get more and more restricted with your ability to move through that joint because now we have a decrease in the signal. The signal is more staticky. Um, muscle is weaker in that area. And then it's also starting to get tighter and tighter and tighter. And now we enter this negative feedback loop where we have all these things that are happening at the joint, making it harder and more difficult to continue to use it the way in which it's intended to. And that's why the analogy of a car is very, um, 
effective because our joints are intended to be cars. They're intended to run and perform well, like this race car. They're intended to bring us in different directions at high and low speeds to stop, to start in all areas of movement. Okay. So we're all, you know, we have the ability to use these joints. If we have the proper function, we want to maintain the ability to keep the car healthy, keep the wheels spinning, keep the engine oiled up. So when we look at chronic or acute injuries, okay, so again, things that are disrupting our ability to move from the joint. So a chronic injury, obviously, something that's happening consistently over time, right? And wheelchair, people in individuals in wheelchairs, spinal cord injured athletes, we see this a lot. Obviously, we are seated. Um, for long periods of the, t the, of the day, um, we, we aren't bringing our body through, I would, I'd say normal ranges of motion. Cause we're living a little bit differently in a chair and compensation begins to occur. Okay. So we begin to build discomfort. We begin to be used. Our body gets used to being in these fixed positions for long periods of time. Again, we're not using our joints in the way they're properly intended to. Okay. So scar tissue forms, okay. More atrophy happens like we just talked about and we begin to lose the function specifically, you know, um, in the areas that we're compensating from, obviously we can't use some joints because we have spinal cord injuries. I'm specifically referring to the joints that we can use. Okay. So all of these things start to form, making it harder and harder and harder to move, okay? So if you don't consistently um, counteract that with movement, okay, the car is gonna catch on fire, right? It's gonna break down. Things are gonna, it's gonna start running slower. Um, be, it's not gonna be as efficient as it once was. You're gonna start experiencing discomfort in that joint. Maybe it's pain. And then ultimately loss of proper function, which brings us back to, again, not being able to use the joint properly. So we end up with something like this, right? Just, I don't know where I found this. I think this guy's definitely not from, from America, in my opinion. But uh, we end up with something completely different because of these injuries, okay? We once started with a car, injuries happen, chronic lifestyle happens. We're consistently in these different positions at all times. And we end up with something that's so far away from what it once was that it's not functioning properly to where you're all over the road, going left and right, breaking and stopping and not moving super efficiently. So again, talking about how this you know relates to wheelchair users specifically, I wanted to cater this conversation to, well, we look at a lot of wheelchairs users, they use their shoulders as legs, right? Since we don't have the use the ability to use our legs, we have to rely on our shoulders to pick up the support, whether it be pushing in a chair, whether it be getting ourselves upright in the car, transferring. Okay. We have an extremely high demand on, again, what we talked about earlier in the conversation of the shoulder joint already being the least stable. And now we're asking it to do these tough movements over and over and over consistently to where it's, it's just not built and designed for that, which is okay. We can learn how to operate that and maximize that potential in the shoulder. That's exactly what we're going to do. But now the need to keep our shoulders healthy is greatly heightened because of this lifestyle that we now have to adapt to um, and get accustomed to. So that chronic, chronic movement pattern of being in the chair uh, puts us in these positions consistently or the resting posture of our body as well, right? A lot of us, if we lack core or low back, we kind of have to be somewhat into this, this kind of rounded position. Um, so we get more and more hunkered down, more fibrotic in the shoulder. and It gets more and more difficult to lift our arms overhead. So easy question, right? Like how do we fix this, right? And this is all just to say the way we can improve this, right? Granted, there's not an acute injury happening currently, right? So if you don't have currently a torn rotator cuff or a torn pec muscle, the way we can improve our joint health is by using your joints 
in the way in which they were intended to be used. Super simple. Okay, this isn't earth shattering stuff, right? Who would have thought? If you use your joint the way it's intended to be used, bring it through its full range of motion on a consistent basis, you will improve the joint health and the joint quality. You'll maximize, you'll be able to maximize, if not expand your range of motion capacities. You'll be bringing in nourishing fluids to help nourish the joint. Again, now we're moving our joints in these positions they're not used to. So we'll get the muscle tissue around the joint stronger. And that's all gonna lead us to building more resilient shoulders, more resilient joints in general. And that's all we're trying to do here is just maximize our ability to move from these joints consistently on a daily basis. This stuff is like brushing your teeth. I call it your movement hygiene. You can do this all the time. Jeff does this every single day, whether it's in the gym or not. Um, and, it, and we can do this in a variety of different ways, which we're going to tap into right now. So the acronym I'll be using for these movements are called CARS. And we're going to go over some of them. We, we're just going to do upper body today. Um, so we'll go through neck, um, shoulder, shoulder blade, and then elbow. I didn't put it in there. We'll, we'll do the elbow as well. And then we'll do wrist CARS as well. So CARS stands for controlled articulate rotations. That's just a fancy word for, again, bringing your articulate joints, these joints we're talking about, through their full range of motion and their full um, movement abilities and capacities. So me and Luke are going to do that together. I'll kind of show you exactly how I coach that up. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and then I'm going to get myself a little bigger so I could see me. Perfect. I'm gonna lower that a little bit. Luke. Hey, everybody. Hi, Luke. Um, and then how do I see myself on this loop? Do you know how to switch this? Oh, there we go. Perfect. Okay, cool. Awesome. So we're gonna start again. We're gonna do upper body today um, because that is a little bit more relevant with spinal cord injuries. And we're gonna start with the neck. So as we walk through these movements. One thing we really want to rehearse and remember is that we are only targeting the joint that we're targeting, okay? So we want to really try, and we're gonna start with the neck here in a second. When I bring neck, uh, neck, when I bring Luke through the shoulder car, that's a good nickname though. Um, when I bring Luke through this neck car, he's going to really try and keep the rest of his body quiet and maximize the ability that he has to create motion at the neck joint. So if you're somebody who doesn't have um, a lot of core function, that's totally fine. What I want you to, what I really want to encourage you to do is create a little more stability for your body. So you're not compensating as much. So that could just be as simple as like grabbing the chair to create a little bit more stability, putting your hands on a table, um, anything you can do to create more stability. Now, if you have core, a good amount of core. Something I cue Luke on is just like engaging his core a little bit so he can be a little more stable from this position. Okay, so we're gonna start with the neck and then for Luke, uh, I'm gonna have you just take this off. Thanks. And we're gonna start with neck cars. Okay, so his eyes are closed. I'm gonna just have him relax, take a deep breath and he's gonna bring his chin to his chest nice and slowly. So his chin draws to his chest he holds that position. Now we have one of the primary functions of your neck right now, and that's neck flexion. That's just bending of your neck. If you're tight in here, you're going to feel a nice little stretch through the backside of your traps right there. Okay. Now Luke's going to keep his chin to his chest, and he's going to trace his right collarbone nice and slow with his chin. And you can see now we're getting another primary function of the neck, rotate, cervical rotation of his neck. Okay, so he's holding that position and come back to the middle for me, Luke. And I'm gonna give you guys his resources for all this. So don't worry about remembering all this. I kind of wanted to show you how to do these and then you'll be able to rehearse these movements um, with the resources. So his chin comes down and then he really places a big emphasis on scraping the collarbone and rotating. If you're tight in this position, I see this all the time, come back here. You're gonna to wanna to do this here. You're gonna to wanna to do a side bend with your right ear to your right shoulder. You're gonna try and create that motion by bending your head to the side as opposed to rotating, 
Okay, so I want a big emphasis on that rotation. So his head's on a swivel, his spine is a towel, he's just, his neck's a towel, he's just wringing out the towel. Perfect. Okay, he's gonna hold that position. Okay, and then from here, he's gonna get lateral flexion of his neck. He's gonna dump his right ear to his right back pocket. So he's, now he's side bending, closing this joint. And as he starts closing that joint, he's gonna start tracing the ceiling with his chin, getting extension of his neck. And then he's gonna come over, dump his left ear to his left back pocket, nice and slow. Keep going if you can. And then he's gonna get his collarbone and trace it in all the way. Nice and slow and relax, okay? Again, he did a good job of going slow, being mindful through these movements and only working the neck joint. One thing I want you to think about that's really important as we go through these movements, if you, so come down for me here and go to the right. If you start feeling a pinch, quote unquote, in a closing joint angle. So come back here for me. So as he rotates here, just do a side, side neck. As he side crunches his neck here, he's closing this angle. This is the closed joint. And this is the open part of the joint right now. It's normal to feel stretching through the open part of the joint, right? Because right now we're lengthening all that muscle tissue here. If you feel a pinch on the closed portion of the joint, I don't want you to work through that, okay? What I want you to make sure is on any closed joint, and we'll, we'll look at all the closed joint movements throughout today, you're not just trying to crank through that and push through the pain, which I know a lot of men do all the time. I want you to really try and work around that. So if you get a little bit of a pinch right here, instead of trying to just push through that and crank through your neck, you could be jeopardizing that joint a little bit. I want you to instead avoid that area and then return back to the movement and go through the range of motion that you're capable of without experiencing that closed joint. Now, when you go through this, you're gonna feel some tightness in the neck, um, up into the trap, the suboccipitals up in here, maybe even your, your sternocleidomastoid, all these muscles into the neck, okay? So again, we talk about a great movement for anybody with a spinal cord injury, for anybody in general, but especially our, our wheelchair users, because our head position sometimes has to be a little bit ducked out and forward, right? So those muscles start to get wound up and anchored down, okay? So that's the neck, all right? Next one we're gonna do is a, sh a shoulder blade car. How many reps of that would yep. someone try to do? At the that's good, especially? I like that. So um, that's a good question. So Luke asked how many reps. Um, I like to start between six to 10 reps. One thing that I want to also bring up is these can be performed on a scale of intensity. Okay. So like we've been doing a lot of shoulder cars with Jeff and Jeff's getting really good at shoulder cars. So we'll actually start weighting up his shoulder car with an active hand and start putting weight into that shoulder car. That's obviously a higher intensity. What we're teaching you today is like a daily movement practice. So I want you to go with fairly low intensity. So if 100% was you, your maximal effort going just absolutely as hard as you can, trying to really open up that joint, I want you to be doing these movements at around like 20 to 40% intensity. Okay, so six to 10 reps each direction, about 20 to 40% intensity as you do this on your own. Once you build up, once you get stronger, you can start implementing more intensity. Okay, great question. Thank you, Luke. Okay. Yeah, any guess? Yeah. Um, can I pre-frame what these have done for me? Let's do that at the end. Yeah. Let's do that because that's so much I want to get to, and I want to make sure that we have time. Um, perfect. Okay. So the next one we're going to do is okay. So the shoulder blade's not technically a joint. Um, however, there's 17 different muscles okay, that attach your shoulder to your shoulder blade. Okay. So there's so much going on in this area, and the shoulder blade has such a big function of posture, back position but also shoulder movement. Um, the shoulder blades especially are a type of movement that I want us to be hitting on a consistent basis as well. So for this one, Luke, I want you to just kind of turn your chair a little bit. We'll get you at like 15 degrees or, yeah, that's perfect. And actually, why don't you turn that way from, that'll be better. Yeah. Beautiful, thanks, sir. Okay, so again, Luke's goal here is to only work through his shoulder blades. So his hands are gonna kind of stay at the side. I'm gonna kind of lower this so you can see his arms a little bit more. Perfect, don't need to see me. 
White legs. Lead. Okay, so <laughs> real nice legs, huh? So showing them off for y'all. Jeff likes that. He's always making sure everyone's wearing sh uh, shorts in the gym. Okay, eyes are up, spine is straight. And then from here, Luke's going to start by shrugging his shoulders to the ceiling. So kind of what you would think is like bad posture, quote unquote. Okay, maintaining that shrug to the ceiling. He's now going to open his shoulder blades and pull them apart like a book. So start spreading your shoulder blades. Good. Now we're getting a huge stretch on your upper back, your rhomboids, your um, traps, all those muscles. And now he's going to depress his shoulders, pull them down to the floor, get a nice stretch on your traps, squeeze them together, retract. Now we're getting really good posture, right? Big chest position. And then he's going to start elevating, shrugging the shoulders. And now we're just continuing to draw this circle. Keep going as I talk, Luke. Again, compensation patterns with this movement as we go through and draw this circle with the shoulder blades a lot of individuals will try and start moving their shoulders to create that motion they'll start cranking on their neck i want you to think everything's frozen besides the shoulder blades the shoulders have to go along for the ride a little bit but your focus is to not be really bending your elbows or turning your shoulders too much. It's all right here in the scapula. After about six reps that direction, now we switch directions. He depresses, he pulls back, he shrugs, he retracts, and he comes back down. Again, we are bringing his shoulder blades through their full range of motion. How often and consistently do we do these things on a daily basis? For most of us, it's not much right? So if you don't continually use the ability to do this, it will become harder, 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 and more and more difficult. Great job, Luke. Rest. Okay. So as shoulder blades, we're going to go into shoulders next. And if you can do one shoulder, uh, excuse me, one car for the rest of your life, it would be the, the shoulder car. Okay. So for the shoulder car, I'm going to have you turn towards them a little bit, just a couple degrees. This is the big, the big, the money car. Yep. They're all important, but this one's the thing for your buck. And maybe back up a little bit more. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. So again, we're isolating everywhere else. If you have the ability, I want you to activate your core, create some tension. And what we can even do out here too is flex this arm and really try and white knuckle it. Okay. So the more tension we can create throughout the rest of the body, the more freely we can uh, move here. Okay, so Luke's gonna start with his palm up and he's gonna start dumping his thumb out. Okay, so he's dumping his thumb out as he comes up, nice and slow. And he's gonna start drawing a Y pattern with his arm. Yep, so come up a little bit wider. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, so we already have a plethora of movements available here at the shoulder. Hold this position. When he's coming up, He's not coming thumbs up, okay? He's coming with thumbs out because that is externally rotating your shoulder. That movement's really occurring here. And again, when we talk about wheelchair lifestyle, pushing in chairs, where are we normally at, right? We're internally rotated. Our pecs are shortened. Our biceps are getting used to push. We're not in that external rotation. So as we're here, I really want you to focus on dumping your thumb out to create that rotation at that joint. If you want to think about your shoulder being a, a rotisserie, right? Your biceps is a rotisserie. You're trying to rotate the rotisserie this way. Okay. So he keeps coming up. Now we get shoulder flexion, overhead motion, push into that. He's going to hit a block. Once he can't reach it, push into this anymore, he's going to rotate down internal rotation. Again, it's still a function of the shoulder. Most people here are going to feel a really big stretch, their pecs and their biceps. And then from here, he's going to continue to internally rotate, reach back as far as he can into extension, come to the side. He's going to hold that position. And now we're going to redraw that circle, reach straight back, shoulder extension, externally rotate again this is where you get a really nice stretch on the pec and the biceps sweep over keep dumping that thumb out keep going keep going and keep going and i want you to just do two more reps at that speed as i talk okay so 
slow, intentional movement, bringing our joints to our full range of motion. Okay. Keeping your chest square, not turning your chest and only working with what you have available at the shoulder joint. Okay. Every single athlete that comes in this facility, they walk in and right now they just go straight to their joints or excuse me, straight to their cars, straight to their shoulder cars. Okay. Again, daily movement. We should be doing these every single day, big stretch, come back around. I really like to, um, you're going to be moving, go ahead and relax. You're going to be moving a lot more through these ranges of motion as you think. So, you know, somebody's tight here, they might rotate. Um, as you go into here, you might shrug up, you might reach back. Okay. You might create all these compensations. What I really like and I encourage is a lot of people to just like watch themselves in the mirror as you do this. Okay. The more you watch yourself in the mirror, as you go through these, you're going to build um, more awareness with how much you're actually compensating through these movements. Because again, it has been a while since you brought that joint through its full range of motion. Okay. So that's the shoulder car. All right. Next, we're going to go with the elbow car. Okay. So we'll just teach this like in, in the way I've been teaching it lately. Yep. Palm. Um, yep. Palm here. And again, we're only trying to move from the elbow joint. Now a super important joint when it comes to shoulder and wrist health, pushing away, extending his triceps and then rotating and creating rotation at the elbow. I'll tell a lot of people to just stare at their biceps here. So if you literally just look at your biceps and you'll see as you kind of press away, you might want to rotate that biceps again, try and only work from the elbow joint. Okay. It's a lot of intentionality to not move in a weird way. Yep. Doing these. Totally. So it, takes, it can take some time. Definitely, definitely gonna take time. So that's the elbow car, pretty straightforward. These ones are pretty simple. And then the last one, um, if you have the function to use your wrist, we will do wrist cars as well. Okay, so for wrist cars, I actually wanna teach this one today. So palms facing you. And then if anybody has function of their wrist right now, um, I want you to actually try this right now, just to kind of get an idea of how difficult this could possibly be. Okay, so he's gonna take his hand off. You're gonna stare at your forearm. Okay, and then what I want you to do, and even if, if you have a little bit of function of your wrist, try it out too. So stare at your forearm, keep your hand flat like a piece of paper and try and only draw circles with your wrist. It should be a very subtle, light movement. Again, your forearm is locked and your forearm is not moving at all. And you're only drawing circles with your wrist. Keep your hand flat like a piece of paper. Try not to use your knuckles or your fingers. And do a couple more, try and expand that range of motion, feel the muscles in the forearm flex. And then now let's switch directions. Go back to the other way. Pull back into extension, rotate around. And again, forearm stays locked and hands flat. And if you do this correctly, you should feel your forearm muscles kind of activating a little bit um, and kind of waking up and firing up right there. Good, rest. So when we look at the importance of doing these, doing these we already talked about that. Okay. Um, remember, right. If I can't move from a joint, I will compensate. Your body is extremely smart and it will compensate without you even knowing it. So if I lack, um, if we were doing a, a pull up, okay. And if I did not have the shoulder, excuse me, the elbow rotation, right to get into that pull-up, I'll still be able to get in the pull-up. I'll be able to hold on. But what will happen is since we don't have that rotation here at the elbow joints, where do you think you're gonna find it? Your shoulder's gonna crank in, your body will find a way to get that motion and create that motion. So what might be occurring here, right? An inability to rotate at Luke's elbow when he does pull-ups, could present itself here at the shoulder. And that's how closely related, right, our body is. 
and how much these joints, one joint, I, I should say, can affect other joints. And that's why quite often, sometimes like a shoulder problem isn't always a shoulder problem, it's a shoulder blade problem. Or again, an elbow problem isn't always an elbow problem, it's a wrist problem or a wrist problem or a shoulder problem, right? Vice versa. So the importance to be able to use this isn't only for the joint that we're working, but also the neighboring and surrounding joints as well. I know that's a lot to remember. Again, I'm gonna share um, those resources with you. We're gonna give you guys videos on all of these. Um, and that's really all I have. I'll open up the questions um, before Luke kind of talk about, you know, how have shoulder cars helped you, if at all, um, or, or any of the cars, I should say. Yeah, um, everyone can hear me all right? Yep. Awesome. So I, these changed my life because I had some issues with my wheelchair and I was pushing a lot and it would sort of pop up like, oh, my shoulder hurts. And now the other shoulder hurts because I'm compensating. And once I started doing these routines regularly, it just takes that away. I will go from having shoulder pain to seven days into the car's routine, not having shoulder pain. And as long as I continue that routine, I don't have the pain. It's that remarkable. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and, and just a good reminder of, right, like we don't have to reserve movement for the gym. I think in this society, in this culture, we get in this like all or nothing mindset and this idea of like, oh, I, I only work out when I go to the gym. It's like, that's not how your body works, right? Your body is always being used and we don't have to reserve these for the gym. Yes, we can do them in the training facility consistently. Um, however, again, just like brushing your teeth, just like you take care of your, the hygiene of your teeth, right? We can take care of the hygiene of our joints and the, the health of our joints on a consistent basis. I do all this every single morning. It takes me about like seven minutes to run through every joint in the body. So this is safe, effective tools for you to use if you feel like you have tight joints. Again, as long as you don't have um, an acute injury currently happening, if that's the case, you need to go to a physical therapist or a physician um, and simple and effective. So that's all I have. I would love to open it up to questions if anybody has any questions for me and hear any of y'all uh, any feedback. Any questions from the group? Oh, I see one. So I was wondering on the rotation of the head, if you go back the other way, once you reach here, is that your second breath going all the way back around the opposite way? Um, yep, you switch directions. That's one rep, yep. So you're gonna go here, all the way around, and then all the way back. That's six reps, or oh, that's one rep, sorry, not six reps, that's one rep. <laughs> yep. um, and, and again, the, so the, I just wanna emphasize with the neck, the neck's very, it's very nuanced. All our joints are nuanced, but there's so much nerves and vasculature that innervate around here um, and go down into the shoulder blade and the shoulder column, uh, shoulder girdle, I should say. So start on the, uh, err on the side of caution with those movements, okay, and really, um, taper yourself up and build yourself up slowly on those. I don't want anybody to like go right into neck cars tomorrow and just be like, Oh my God, I tore my freaking, you know, whatever, because Nikki told me to do uh, neck cars. So <laughs> be really, be really gentle with those movements, especially when it comes to the neck, because the neck has so much different components of them. Any other questions? Any online as well? Oh, there's no online. Uh, I'm going to add that link that you sent, um, but for the people that are um, in the room right now, could you get them um, um, maybe a website that you could say would go to the link? Or they can add their email to the sign-in sheet. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the link that I sent you guys is just a Google Doc. So you guys will just fill that out. I'll get your email and then I'll send you um, those resources directly. Oh, perfect. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Any other questions? No. I just want to say, you guys might have seen me like struggling through some of those, and that's because <laughs> I'm pushing it. When you start these, like we keep saying, 20%, maybe 30% effort, you know, it can be like a nice relaxing thing. Yeah. I sort of uh, am a little hard to call it. Uh, Same. 
same. Nikki just means you are super thorough. So yeah, that's great. Not, not nope, very yep. many questions. Well, thank awesome, you cool. so much for your time and um, for sharing your resources. And hopefully we'll see you all again next month. Awesome. Greatly appreciate it. Appreciate all y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah.